Hello and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plato, and the pothole in my tarmac. Oh, that's another great one there, Dave, isn't it? How? How are you? Very good. Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help you save money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. So how's it going then, Dave? I'm very good, thank you, Mr. Plato. Yourself? Um, uh, yes, on top form, actually. Looking forward to today. Yeah, so am I, because we have a very, very special guest. A gentleman, in fact, who we've been trying to source for this uh, performance for some time, actually. You know, we're a gentleman. now into a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go down that road again. That's a joke from another thing. But anyway, I think you need to, without further ado, introduce yes. our gentleman guest today. Well, our guest today is a TV presenter, a journalist who may just have the about the best job in the world. Mm -hmm. He's known for being quite fond of cars, bikes, and all sorts of weird and wonderful machines in general. And that's why we've booked him for this show. It is, of course, the one and only Mr. James May. Hello, mate. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? What a very nice introduction. I like the gentleman bit as well. I thought, ooh, they're going to go a bit too far with this. Do you know what it was, in all seriousness, <laughs> is that we, we recorded one of these the other day and, um, and, and, and the word gentleman was in the title. And yeah. Jason said gentleman, and then I said gentleman, and then we just kept saying gentleman lots and lots and lots. So it's become a bit of an in joke. So anyway, but you genuinely are a gentleman guest of ours, and we're we're very pleased to to have you along for the ride. And my first question well, to you. both of you, obviously, you two know each other from old. Where did your paths first cross? Was it driven, or did you know each other before that? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I think you. I think did you do driven in starting not about ninety eight ish, James? I did series one of driven with with the other Jason and and uh, Mike Mike Brewer. Yeah, but I only did it for one series because after that I got fired, like I did from everything else. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Well, well, well I must have jumped in your shoes. Then. I think you did. Well, actually, yeah. I think Penny Mallory officially ah. took my place. And, and then I, I you must were... have taken Jason's because he went to. Did he go to Top Gear? I think by me. He went to Top Gear, but he didn't go straight away. So I think you may have been one season late. I think they got you in because you could drive. You could definitely drive things, whereas we could just talk <laughs> bollocks about them. To be honest, but I, but I, well, I can tell you the story behind this now because a long time has passed. But we did one series that was, you know, I did watch a bit of it the other day for the first time in many many years, and it's quite good. We came up with a few quite original ideas like the hmm. three header group test and the, yeah. and the news section inside the truck you know what stuff you would have done as well and that but you know yeah. those were ideas that shall we say reappeared elsewhere hmm. but <laughs> after series one <laughs> they decided this was an early bit of wokeness they thought well this program is not quite right because it's got three white blokes all the same age uh, really it, do you think do you, do you, no they really? told me it, oh, they needed Lord. a woman they needed to have a woman so they couldn't really get rid of Mike Brewer because he had his other shows and he was yeah. very popular. They couldn't really get rid of Jason because he right. was, you know, being groomed for greater things and he was going to become the editor of Car Magazine and all the rest of it. So right. the only target left was me. <laughs> so so I was out the door and that wow. was that, really. Well, I didn't, I didn't know that. But I got fired from everything in the old days. So, you know, I was used to it. <laughs> well, fi funny enough, you, met, you mentioned you, you saw some old clips. I saw some last night. They just appeared on my Twitter feed. And I think it was show one of series one with you. I think it was in a Subaru with, with Brewer. I think you were in a BMW. Yes, that's right. That's the one yeah. I saw. I didn't watch yeah. the whole thing because I was cringing. But I was in the yeah. then new three series. Yeah. And there was, a, a, yeah, the Subaru and the Audi. Yeah. So it was a good little the... item. Yeah. 20, yeah, th that must be, well, 30 years ago, isn't it? Best part. Best part, uh, well, not quite. Yeah. 1998, yeah. I think. It's a long time ago. It's the colour's all different, isn't it? I mean, mainly yeah. because it was fashionable to wear autumnal hues, I think, in <laughs> the fashion industry. So we all look a bit beige, or I look a bit beige anyway. And I've got very short hair and a slightly sort of puffy baby face. And I'm sounding ever so enthusiastic about being on television. You know, <laughs> stuff too. No, well, that's what it was like, though, wasn't it, in the early days? It we'd over-present over and like, be a bit overly keen. Yes, yes, you would. And you'd... And you, and, the, the sort of the ways of making it were slightly different. So the camera would sort of, the car would go round. Did you notice the car would go upside down? Because they'd obviously got a new gadget that made the tracking yeah. camera rotate. So they <laughs> they'd thought, use well, it a lot. That. Yeah. Mm. And then, you know, the camera would come through the window and you'd go, well, 
whatever Jason's saying is rubbish because I'm in the new BMW M3 and you know what that means. Like, oh, God, you idiot. How yeah. did you ever get a job? And do, you, do you remember how big the kit was? The cameras were oh, yeah. massive, weren't they? Yeah, the cameras were massive and the cameras in the car. Now, this is interesting. I was talking, this is not interesting for your listeners, but it's interesting for us. <laughs> I was talking to someone the other day about the in-car mini cam. So they went from being quite massive to being really quite small camera heads about the size of a GoPro. Mm. Right. Then you had a separate little light that always rattled with with French flag. It looked like something from World War Two. It was made of, of you know grey painted tin. But then they fell out of fashion as the as the um, cards came in to replace the tapes. And now when we're doing Grand Tour, we have these massive, effectively SLR cameras, but movie spec. Yeah stuck onto the windscreen and about 25 to 30 percent of your forward vision is obscured by those cameras <laughs> yeah, yeah, it scares yeah. the shit out of me yeah, one yeah. day there's going to be like a woman with a pram exactly in line with the camera <laughs> and i'll go off saying and here i am driving the oh dear <laughs> but I, I just find it terrifying though as you say you know that was 1998 which in my mind and in my world isn't that long ago but it's no. the fact that then you work it out and it's 25 years ago because for me and i'm sure we're all the same is that the the noughties i hate the term for that decade but anyway the the early 2000s just seemed to go and then the 2010s just seemed to go and here we find ourselves in the 20s but there was somebody pointed this out the other day to me as a sort of stat and it terrified me is that we are now as far away from the year 2000 as 1977 was do you see what i mean oh god yes which is a horrible and terrifying thought when you think about the year 2000 doesn't seem that long ago. I remember the no. Millennium Bug and I remember where I was on New Year's Eve 1990 to 2000. I have a very, very clear memory of New Year's Eve 1999 with uh, mm. my then girlfriend. And we went to various things. And we went up to see the fireworks and things um, from Parliament Square. I can remember all sorts of details about that, but then it becomes the the noughties or the nunnies or whatever we're going to call yeah, them. Yeah. And everything from then till now is, <laughs> I, there are no distinct events in it for me. No. It's all the same thing. It's yeah. just like a big minestrone of stuff going on. <laughs> but when you say, it's a very interesting stat that this is as far from 2000 as 2000 was from 1977. Does that mean looking back from now at 2000, 2000 is as horrible as 1970 <laughs> when we were in 2000 because because that's terrible if it is uh oh, i just it just it just scares me the fact that the years are just racing by but anyway we're sounding yeah. we're sounding possibly borderline old at the moment aren't we so yes we should, uh, well we should... i'll bring it down a bit yeah but you get get back to the youth culture I'll bring bit. it down i can remember yeah. 99 be, being with a few pals and we were it we it was the new, new year's eve and we were in the town square in Chamonix, and somehow we blagged ourselves up to the first floor. Of what this amazing bit building with huge, great big kind of palatial outside w windows, but then there was mm. a balcony which ran all the way around the outside. So, yeah. like a, a lovely old, I guess there'd be like George in here, but mm. whatever they are over there. <laughs> and and we, me and a few mates got out, and we thought, well, well, let's start a snowball fight. So we we got some snow and started throwing it down. Well, the whole town square turned on us and they pulled the windows through oh, really? <laughs> yeah 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 and we we somehow managed to get away with it but that's what i distinctly remember about the the turn of the millennium was all the windows coming in this amazing place this bar restaurant type thing I see most of us just had quite a nice time. We didn't go abroad and smash the place up. <laughs> well, <laughs> get involved in some international incident, Jason. Well, we, well, I mean, we just threw an innocent one or two snowballs and it, it backfired badly. That would be called escalation these days. I don't think we Is used it... that word back then, but... No, <laughs> yeah. I think you... I, I, rem I remember... I remember I was actually back home by midnight with my missus at the time oh, who, had, who had had too much to drink. Um, and so I had to carry her back. And then on that evening, for some reason, and I don't know why they went down this road, they did a special of the big breakfast, but it was on in the evening. They did like a sort of late night one with, with Johnny Vaughan and Denise Van Outen. And I ended up being back there with a can of lager watching this on my own thinking, <laughs> well, this is shit, isn't it? You know, this is like the dawn of a new, of a new millennium. I mean, I'm really thoroughly overwhelmed so far. New Year's Eve is often disappointing, though, isn't it? It is. Everybody it is. says that, and that one was just particularly bad for you. Your particularly <laughs> bad one, mine was in about 1982, but your bad one just happened to coincide with the new millennium. It's, yeah. it's bad luck, but 
Yeah, there it is. Can of lager, big breakfast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was pretty shit. Actually, <laughs> Miss, <mate>. Mrs. Starface <laughs> on the bed. You know. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, we are sounding a bit old. We Let's are. talk about something that happened in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> so James Top Gear Grand Tour without giving obviously anything away that's what you know we all know and lo- love you for but is it you know is is that chapter closed for you no you, you, um, you guys now or <clears throat> now, now, now that the big man has gone has gone off and plowing fields badly or is it still <laughs> going to be stuff to do well I mean we never I mean I'm being perfectly honest with you now because there, there's nothing to hide but we don't mm. We don't often think more than about a year in advance because, yeah. let's, let's face it, we're old, yeah. so you can't. So, mm-hmm. I mean, we've got another another one about to come out. Um, we've just filmed another one a few weeks ago, and we've oh, got okay. another one planned to film later on this year. So um, what happens after that, I don't know. That's a bit of a grey fog, but it always yeah. is. Yeah, uh, yeah. Jeremy is ploughing his farm. I've been cooking, um, doing some travel, Hammond's taking his own cars apart and failing to put them back together <laughs> uh so we're I d- yeah well i mean it's not over yeah it's good. not over but we're probably good. nearer the end than the beginning oh god let's <laughs> hope so we don't want another 20 years of this <laughs> uh, otherwise that's i'll be like... sitting saying oh you know it was only 2023 and that's as long ago now as 2000 <laughs> was from 2023 or oh well, that's uh, good news yeah absolutely absolutely because i was i was worried that you know Obviously, events of late might have sort of put a full stop on that, but actually, I'm I'm pleased that it's carrying on as as will many many people. In terms of uh, Top Gear, as we said, obviously, as James said, what you're arguably best known for. Um, am I right in thinking are the best memories for you, the overseas adventures and the specials that you did, are those the memories that you hold most dear? Yes, despite what I said earlier about it all being a big soup, mm. there are some there are bits that stand out in particular. Um, I think. I mean, the most amazing thing about it is all the places I've been to and seen that I would never have been to and seen otherwise. I mean, mm, when I was yeah. younger, I did travel a bit. I used to travel around on my own. But to be honest, I I would do things like go cycling or on nice train journeys through Europe. And once or twice I went to the US, to California and yeah. New York. But as a result of the TV job, you know, I've been to the magnetic North Pole across various deserts. I've been to Japan Oh, eight or nine times and and so on and i just don't think that would have happened otherwise so mm. um the the memories are i mean the past has gone i've often yeah. said that in a very cynical way but it, in a sense it hasn't gone because they they must have made a difference to the person i am now in the same way that uh <clears throat> excuse me i'm coughing in the same way that what you eat and where you yeah. live does yeah. you know so yeah i mean it's been I've always said that if it ends tomorrow, I don't mean because I die. I mean because you know I'm <laughs> cancelled or fired again or whatever. You know, the only truly magnanimous thing to do would be to say, "Well, that was good, wasn't it?" And I was very lucky. You can't yeah. really complain and go, "No, oh, for God's sake," you know, because just one week of it is pretty good. Twenty yeah. years, twenty years is a bit of a steal. I'm amazed yeah. we've got away with it, but there you go. Don't Where was the, we- the weirdest place you would say, say you'd been? I mean, d- did you ever go to North Korea or anything like that? Uh, I've not been to North Korea, no. Um, I've been to some remote bits of Russia, which were pretty weird, places like Nizhny Novgorod and uh, some other place up in Siberia. I've been to Mongolia, which is not, I mean, it's not weird. It's just, well, it's empty, yeah. but it's amazing but it's 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 again it's a place no i you know i would never have thought hmm, where shall i go <laughs> mongolia I too. yeah <laughs> i have to go to mongolia but we did end up driving across mongolia and it was incredible really so that one stands out the, the magnetic north pole stands out because to be honest i didn't like it i don't like snow yeah i don't particularly <laughs> like cold and as i said at the time i don't like noisy technical clothing with velcro on it because it's just it's <laughs> annoying and people used to say, what's it like? What's it like going to the North Pole? That must be amazing. And I said, no, go home, open the, open the fridge, kneel down and stick your head in the icebox and stay there for three weeks. Then you'll know exactly what it's like. <laughs> okay, that's the view. That's the sensation. That's all there is to it. You don't come across, and there's no, you don't come across a town, obviously, or a mm. bar or yeah. even a colour other than white. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not really that. And when you get to the North Pole or the magnetic North Pole, as we went to, there's, 
there's nothing there either. You sort of you instinctively think, well, there's got to be a visitors center or a yeah. 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 shop. <laughs> there's not even there like a pile of bricks and then nothing. No, no nothing. Not even a, a can of snowballs. You just get there and the, and the sat nav goes a bit. He goes a bit mad because he doesn't know where it is. Everything is south <laughs> from there, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, it's not like Stonehenge at all. There's no I mean, druids, it, no cars. Yeah. Stonehenge at least has got an underpass, hasn't it, underneath the road and the gift shop and everything, and probably yeah, got, a cafe. But you get all sorts imagine. of things at Stonehenge. Yeah. You can you can have a party there. It's great. But the North Pole, <laughs> there was there was nobody there. Right, I'm striking but, that off the list then. Fuck I would that. strike that off the list. <laughs> yeah. Take that off off the list. I mean, the thing that I used to sort of really enjoy about you know watching the specials over the years was the fact that um, obviously you know plans were in place for the trip as a whole and, and, and extensive plans, no doubt. And we, you know, we had Richard Porter on here uh, recently as well. And we were talking a little bit about that, but it's just the fact that obviously certain things will, will naturally go wrong and cars will yes. go wrong and all these different things. So I've often the best laid plans will then have to be ripped up. And I would imagine that's all quite exciting when you're almost trying to work out a plan for the next day, based upon the fact that what you'd intended to do and where you'd intended to go was now completely not possible. Yes, there is quite a lot of that. It's one mm. of those weird, it's, it's a slight conundrum because you sort of feel if you take three blokes who have been working together for a long time and understand each other and have to, you know, know how to how to sort of mm. bounce off each other, then you should just be able to put them in a car, you know, in three cars, um, <laughs> say at one side of, yeah. of the middle of Africa with the job of driving across to the other side. And as we sometimes say in TV, the universe will provide. Of course, if you do a thing like that, it's going to be an adventure and things mm. will happen. Mm. But you still make a plan because somehow if you didn't make a plan, they wouldn't happen. Yeah. Part of part of them happening is is them not going according to plan, but that can't happen if there is no plan, if you see what I mean. Yeah. That's like Russell's paradox or something. But it's quite a lot of the show ends up being, yeah, stuff that just happened and you know, it's not it's not scripted in the true sense. So it's just what happened and what we said. Mm. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, in fact, that often produces the best moments, though, doesn't it? Oh, I think yes. I think our best moments have been unexpected and ad lib. Yeah, definitely. It's down to the editor. I mean, that poor sod to find it because <laughs> if we I make mean, a one and a half hour special, how many tapes? Specials, well, it's, cards. How many cards? Well, Hundreds. I, yeah, because we've got say generally sort of between 12 and 14 days filming mm. there are three main camera crews uh, plus a drone crew plus three or sometimes four mini cams per car yeah, yeah. plus effects cameras on the outside of the car to get some yeah. of that action and most of them are running most of the time so it's yeah. i mean the yield in tv is famously yeah. poor you film <laughs> all this stuff and then you get like 10 seconds at the end it must be particularly bad for us, but some poor sods actually got to watch it all. I wouldn't even want to watch me, you know. I, <laughs> Not just my bit. Two. Yeah, I quite but, like my bit, you know. I wouldn't watch theirs as well. God. But also, presumably, you know, when, again, with the dynamic with the three of you knowing each other so well, I would, I would hazard a guess that for the most part, when you came over as being pissed off with each other or you came over as being absolutely falling about laughing at each other that was all real wasn't it you know i mean i, I, mean, I would imagine the, you the can't... pissed off is definitely real the pissed yeah. off was definitely real yeah absolutely <laughs> when they've kind of messed around with your car or they've done this or they've hidden that or whatever you know that was all natural wasn't it yes yes it's i mean the truth is we're not actors <laughs> and there are times when we've tried to sort of act bits and you think, oh, dear, we better just quietly throw that away because it's pure cheese. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, we're not actors. We're just, we're just car journalists, really, who happen yeah. to have been put on. Well, you know what I mean, Jason. It's, yeah, yeah. It starts with the subject. It doesn't, doesn't start with a particular presenting or acting skill. I know exactly what you mean about trying to act. So, some directors will, will kind of overproduce you and they get you to do, do something. God, it feels awful, doesn't it? Yeah. And actually, when you then go, well, can I just have a look at that? Thanks. You just want to rip, pull the card out and throw it away because yeah. it is just cheesy, isn't it? Yeah. And when they say, can you be angry about this? And I think, well, I'm not angry. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm yeah, not angry. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually finding it quite amusing. So, oh. <laughs> so I can't, how do you pretend to be angry? This is what it makes you realize that acting is actually a great skill. Yes. It's, yes. It's yes. bloody difficult. Yeah, definitely harder than you think. Another little pro project you're onto is this is, your, is this book, Little Experts. Mm. And I must say, I've had a quick browse through, through it, and it's brought back tons of ace memories. Like I can remember going to the, the, the States when I was 
probably eight, nine years old and going to a, a, like a rollerblade park yeah. with the disc. I can remember that and that. But also I can remember, you know, there's that set section on building your go-kart. Yes. God, I can remember. I've still, I, in fact, I, the first thing I did was I looked at my knees and I've seen so, some of the old scars <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for some of the shunts. It's a great little book. Tell us a bit more about it, Jen. Well, it's about, I mean, to be honest, when they approach me, they've done a whole series. So there's ones mm. about the human body, money, uh, the environment, animals. Because Deborah Meaden's done one, hasn't she? And yeah, Deborah Meaden's done the money one, yeah. which yeah. is great, actually. I could learn mm. some stuff about that because I'm notoriously very poor with money. But they, they want. They started off wanting me to do sort of vehicles in general, and I said, well, "That's a that's a massive subject. How about human powered ones? Because mm. there's the obvious ones like bicycles yeah. and pedal cars, but then there's some odd stuff like you know human powered airplanes and submarines and so on. So that's what we made it. And I know what you mean about go karts because when I was writing that bit, I thought, God, yeah, me and my mate Cookie, we spent hours believing that we were almost like Formula One designers. And we would, they, I mean, they were just planks of wood and nails, yeah. obviously. Yeah. But, you know, we thought it was all very special. But we, you could never find the bloody wheels. Wheels were always so difficult yes. to get hold of. Yeah. And if you heard of somebody that had an old pram, you think somebody's got an old pram, we'll have the wheels. And we go running around there and you'd find mm. this thing in the garden all buckled and completely useless. <laughs> yeah. Wheels were wheels were like a currency. Yeah, yeah gold dust. Especially yeah, if you get a, a pair that matched. <laughs> yeah, highly unlikely. <laughs> the same there circumference, of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are a lot of go-karts going around, yeah, very, yeah. like, designed for left-hand bends. Sort of well, thing. do you know what? I did, I presented um, the, the one of the first Red Bull soapbox races oh, up yeah, in yeah. Round, round Day Park in Leeds mm. way back when. And I'll I, I tell you what, it was one of the best days ever because there's these absolute fruitcakes who have just designed... The, the most danger they can into this thing and mm-hmm. the shunts they had there was teeth hanging out there was faces off but they just loved it and their creations yeah. were great mm. it is it can be catastrophically dangerous <laughs> i mean I'm, a, I'm amazed that we used to we had a couple of courses for these various homemade carts and bicycles because we used to put bicycles together out of bits and do things like put a chopper front wheel on a racing bike frame <laughs> to Ooh. see what Ooh. would happen yeah and there were a couple of routes. So there was one off-road route through the, there was sort of parkland, but it wasn't a formal park. So there was a, effectively the, the off-road course through there. But then on the nearby housing estate, there were various straight bits. And there was one bit that had, I mean, it was, it was basically, the housing estate was laid out pretty much on a grid pattern. You know, it was a 70s type yeah. housing estate. But there was one bend in it that went downhill and had a pronounced left hander with a camber on it, cambered Ooh. the correct way. Ooh, and nice. it was known it was known locally as the fabulous bend. Because that's <laughs> where you went to test out your new bike tires or your, the, the people who actually lived on it must have been so pissed off with us. Yeah. But I'm I am amazed because it was quite steep as well. Um nobody ever I mean, there were sort of bruises and and scrapes and maybe the odd broken collarbone but i don't think anybody was seriously hurt i always i mean if you looked at it now you'd think we well, can't do that because you're going to get run over by a car coming yeah. you're going to get run over by a mark one granada coming the other way around the bed <laughs> but nobody worried we didn't even put anybody at the end to keep a look at you just went flying down there yeah. and everybody survived yeah Better absolutely they were back then they Better were there, times weren't they? To be you know, a kid and, to have fun. Yeah, you're not allowed to do anything now, and the kids aren't uh, allowed to play conkers, and they're not allowed to do this, and they're not allowed to do that. Are they really not allowed to play conkers? Well, that, that is... I, I mean, yeah, that might be an exaggeration, but I know that certainly, you know, there was people that was against it a, a few years ago. So, um, you know, um, I mean, I know, you, I know, you're not allowed to use j- Japanese th- throwing stars in the play, <laughs> playground anymore. I know that's <laughs> no, definitely not odd. All, the, all those n- nunchucks, you can't not use like those anymore. Days, <laughs> you know, I can remember those being at my school. I can. <laughs> some 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 ruffian had those. I, I must admit, I mean, we're, we're we're straying into old fart conversation again. But yeah, yeah. some years, I mean, this is, well, early early thousands again. But I was so I live quite near Ravenscourt Park in West mm. London, and I was walking through there with a mate, and there there are some massive, what I'd call conker trees, and the floor underneath them was just littered in conkers. And I thought something very strange has happened because when I was ten. Yeah. You'd have been knocking the conkers down before they were ready. You know, you'd yeah. be there with a stick or yeah. something trying to yeah. get them down. But now they're just lying on the floor rotting and nobody wants the conkers. Nobody wants that joy of finding one a belter. that's still in the shell. But yeah. but it's just about to open. You put your fingernail in and as it comes open for about half a minute, the conker is really shiny. Yes. And then it goes off. It turns sort of matte. But in that initial moment, it's it's sort of oiled. 
And yeah. it's a yes. thing of yeah, intense yeah, yeah. beauty and excitement. Yeah, yeah. like but an oil that's, tricky bat. That's lost. Yeah. And you dip, dip them in vinegar and bake them yeah. in the oven and all sorts yep. of stuff to make them rock hard. And then you tie a special type of knot. And then some, some people would... Put, uh, this is because their dad's worked in engineering or something. <laughs> they'd put the string through, but rather than just put the string through and tie the knot, they'd put the string through and then thread a washer. Oh, uh... no, see, I think that a representation to the international referees of concrete it's cheating that, isn't that it? is yeah. not right. I mm. think that was Adrian New- Newey's young lad. I, I read it probably. I mean, it's good thinking from an engineering point of view, but it's not in the spirit of the sport. <laughs> which is right. that the conquer breaks and a bit hits you in the eye. That's Absolutely. how it works. Absolutely. From conquers to cars, I think we need to get back onto the car do. history, Mr. James May. So take us back to take us back to the very beginning, if you will. What are your earliest memories uh, of motor cars? Did it stem from your dad? Was it a family thing? Uh, I think, okay, the very earliest memory of a car that I have was from the age of, well, I must I must have been under three because my younger brother had just been born and he's sort of two and three quarter years younger than me. Yeah. And my dad at that point had a Morris 8 from the late 1930s. That was the only car he wow. could afford. And he'd had it as a student and, you know, rebuilt it. And there were it had leather seats, obviously, because everything did in those days. And they were green because everything was green or brown in Britain in the olden days. And the back seat had a little hole in it. <laughs> and I, when I was sitting in the back, obviously we didn't have child seats or anything. I'd be sitting in the back with my mum, but I'd put my finger in this little hole. And I know it sounds slightly pervy, but even to this day, if I sit and think about it, I can still feel the sensation of that ragged, leathery hole on my yeah. left <laughs> index finger. I can, wow. I, can remem- I can remember the sensation, which is mm. odd because sensation, you know, touch sensations are quite difficult to recall. Yeah. But that one is absolutely clear. So that was the first car memory. And then after that, we had a Mark I um, console, mm-hmm. which is the one yes. that, that sort of looks a little bit like a um, a Chevy Bel Air. You know, it's that sort of Americana shape yeah. board. Yeah. And then we had that, didn't, that one didn't last very long. And then we had a Cortina Mark I, RVX448D. That was the first car whose number plate I learned, and I've known them all since. Right? Can, can I can I just pause you? Can I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just pause you for a second, James? Right, because oh this, is a, this is a constant thread because Jason finds it weird that I know the registration plate of every car that I have ever had, or indeed ever been involved with. So I count all of my dad's cars as well, back to the age of about four or five every single one he thinks that almost like i'm i'm some kind of you know i must be on some kind rain of man. special yeah a rain man spectrum but i think it's quite normal when you're into cars to remember those things. i think it is but the weird thing i've had this conversation with jeremy clarkson because he suffers the same affliction i don't i don't remember the registration numbers of my cars so well one ah. or two i can but all of my mum and dad's cars mm. from a zoo, not, right? not the morris a because i i probably couldn't read then and we only had the console for a few months before it went for scrap. But from the Mark One Cortina RVX four four eight D, which was replaced with the Mark Three Cortina two liter GXL MWB nine five nine K. So I know <laughs> all my dad's registration numbers, <laughs> and then MWB four one six M, which was another console GT. Um, and so is it, it amazing on. that oh. there is a little area in in, in your mind, yeah, which has got a little reservation sticker on it, and that's where you put. Those registration numbers, <laughs> isn't that registration amazing? Number. But, it, but it is, it's even more amazing, though. And, and you know, when you think about it, at the end of the day, this is just some kind of registration mark. And it could be anything, right, just to mm. determine that vehicle from that vehicle. But why, why should we be able to record that? You know, it's not it's not something yeah. memorable. It's not a name. It's not – it's just a collection of, yes. of, of digits and things. But maybe it's because – I don't know. Maybe it's because the cars were so important to us. I think that's it. Yeah. A, a, the cars were very important. Your your yeah. dad's car was the best car in the world. It didn't yeah. matter what it was. It was you know it was an exciting thing. Mm. Uh, the second is those those registration numbers became they're, they're not they're not letters and numbers anymore. They're almost like very short form poetry. Or, yeah. Or or little ditties or maxims. So when I remember like my mother's Vauxhall was R A K. 30r or rack 30r yeah it's not it's i 
it's I have to think what they are actually are as letters and numbers. It's more mm. it's more like these days you'd call it a meme, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that. KKY five two two P was my mum's two CV, and that's a little poem. KKY five two two P. I suppose actually because they're a lot shorter, they're they're a bit easier to to recall. I guess maybe. Yeah, they're noises, aren't they? They're, yeah. They're, yeah. They're, well, do you know? And, and it's 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 funny. And this is sorry. This is God, a, aren't we uh, dull? And, sorry, and, 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 <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm about to get, take it even duller because on, it's in the same sort of way. And this this is this is showing our age. Is remember with the old fashioned telephones with the dial? Is yes. uh, in many ways, and, and it's sort of you just reminded me of it there, James, when you were talking. Is that I could sort of remember my phone number almost by the noises as opposed to the thing, yeah. right? So it was five two two eight three three three. So and then you'd have sort of long ones and then short ones and you know, that's how you remembered things, because it was like a little noise. It was. And you're dead right that with numbers with a lot of low numbers in, when you when you rotated the dial, uh, uh, a, uh, it would uh, wear, wear your fingers out more. Yeah. But it, it, <laughs> it took, I mean, I, I when we made the reassembler program where I put things back together, one of the things I did was a an early Bakelite dial telephone. Mm. And the thing, I mean, I can sort of dimly remember those from kids and I can definitely yeah. remember the bright plastic colored ones with dials which is what we had at home before the trim phone came out you know oh yes you remember that it's yeah, a beauty yeah. wasn't it the but, trim phone but when you turned the dial and then you took your finger out and it by modern standards it took an eternity yeah for the thing because it sort of went uh, <laughs> back to the beginning and it's mm. it's incredible really did you ever learn the trick of how to get a free telephone calls out of a public phone box which oh, had tapping, a dial on it tapping where the yeah where, where, where you tap it out yeah, and it never asked never... you two pence. No, that was fantastic discovering yeah. that, wasn't yeah. it? But sometimes the operator would be listening and knew you were doing it. <laughs> Did you ever get that? So you'd have no, to never, receive no. it to your ear and you'd be going ding, 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 and then this voice would go, I know what you're doing. <laughs> no way. I've, I've got I suppose not... that was some, that was some lady in a little box with a load of, with a load of wires and plugs, yeah. I guess. Mm. I mean, the operator, you don't, I presume there aren't yeah. operators anymore, are there? Yeah. I wouldn't have thought what so. What a strange job. Isn't it? You know, and I always used to think of them because in the cartoons and stuff, they used to, yeah, they used to plug things into like a jack field, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember her name? No, she never told Rosemary. <laughs> oh, oh, Rosemary. Oh, Rosemary. Oh, Rosemary. <laughs> wait, wait, was, it, was it Kung Fu? Uh, was it? Oh, I can't remember. Rosemary, the... the... Hong Kong, Fu, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Fui. Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Fui. Yeah. Hong Kong, yeah. Fui it was with Rosemary, the telephone <laughs> operator. We might yeah. be potentially going down a little, uh, a little uh, cul-de-sac here. So um, uh, back to you, James. First car, then. What was the, what was the first car that you ever had, and, and do you remember passing your driving test? I do remember. Uh, actually, I don't remember passing the driving test, but I remember about an hour later, when my mother said I did it in her car, which was a. Um, a Vauxhall Cavalier, mm. Mark One, and she said I could go out in the car. I do remember the first time I drove a car by myself and going yeah. down the main road and arriving at the traffic lights at the bottom where the big road crossed over and thinking, wait, and they're green, select first. And it was, I mean, I'm surprised. I'm surprised I made it, really. It was so exciting. Yeah. It was, it's, yeah. I mean, I've, I've done, I mean, I learned to fly light aircraft and I went solo and that was an amazing experience, mm. but I, to be brutally honest, it wasn't quite as amazing as the first time you drive a car on your own because yeah. you can't believe you're allowed to do it. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it's we fact we were speaking about it yesterday, or the we other were, day. So yeah. it's, first time you look left and you yeah. realise no you're there. on your There's own. There's no one there. Yeah. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. And you are completely responsible. It's sort of slightly terrifying in a way. Yeah. But it, very, very exciting at the same time. And I can remember... Yeah, so then I crossed over the main road and then went down into, there was a little village, then up the hill, then I'm in the countryside and I can do a, a bit of a sort of round-robin route of about five miles and then took the car and I was exhausted. I had to go and lie down for several hours. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. So, Do you, do you remember hmm. your first shunt? Um, yes. Oh, hang on, let me just think what would be, right, the first shunt where I was driving. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was actually quite a few years later. I had a series of accidents in friends' cars as a passenger. It became a bit of a habit after a while. But then I actually had one of my own when a, when a bloke I knew, but who wasn't, I just happened to know him by chance. I was driving my dad's car at the time, and I simply stopped to turn right, and he absolutely slammed into the back of it and oh, no. did quite considerable damage. That was my dad's Rover, and the other guy was in a... Another Mark III Cortina, actually. I didn't learn the registration number. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the one, on my dad's, 
<laughs> one of my dad's Rover was uh, UUG eight one nine R. It's a, it had to be replaced that... with DET eight four eight V. And what was that? That was another Rover. Oh, was the Rover SD one. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you know, we we joke about the registration plates, and as I say, I can remember mine, but we're probably amounting to a grand total of. I don't know, maybe 12 to 15, maybe a few more cars. With you, James, obviously that number must have another digit on it in terms of the amount of cars that have existed within your, you know, your ownership life. I'm not even going to attempt to go through your car history because we'd be here uh, all day, much as actually we'd both enjoy it. But what does the current fleet consist of to give us a little bit of a flavor of where you are with your mix of tastes Okay. Um, well, it's embarrassing because it's actually t- too many cars. Uh, <laughs> and I'm trying to think which order to do them in. Shall we go? Shall we go woke first or stupid first? <laughs> let's go. Let's go woke first and let's build yeah. to stupidity. Okay. So woke first, I've got uh, a Tesla Model mm-hmm. S. Mm-hmm. I have a Toyota Mirai hydrogen fuel cell right. electric car. Yeah. Um, I have a Fiat Panda. Mm-hmm. I have an Alpine A110. Mm-hmm. Um, at the moment, I have a Triumph Stag in my garage, but it's not really mine. I'm looking after it for someone, but that's a that's not woke though, is it? Actually, let's ignore no. the Stag. The Stags, stags are gone. cool, but they were always but they but they always used to break down though, didn't they? The stags. Well, it's a seventies British car, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's always... that shirt open, chest out medallion, isn't it? The yeah, yes. standing, standing on the hard shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> okay let's ignore the stag because that's not really mine so where did i got to with wokeness fiat panda i'm yeah. on the alpine a110 oh i've um i've got an 88 inch land rover series three i have a land rover freelander mm-hmm. the alpine a110 a 911 carrera 2s a ferrari 458 speciale and mm-hmm. Finally, are you ready? A beach buggy. Oh, oh have you? I always wanted yes. one of those. Yeah, it's in, great. in like in like a candy colour. Oh yes, it's in metal flake red. Oh, lovely! <laughs> it's bloody fabulous. I mean, it's a terrible car because it's a Beetle, obviously. Yeah. It, in fact, it's a compromised Beetle because it's shorter and the tires are too big and it's mm. tail heavy and it's probably technically quite dangerous. But as an artifact or whatever we yeah. call it it's a fantastic i mean it just makes me laugh my head off it's like having a full-size matchbox supercars or hot wheels car it's just ridiculous have you um, never fa- fancied popping a 911 engine in it well i don't that no, really would yes. be dangerous wouldn't it but oh no but that's that that, that 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 didn't go right at the top of the pack for the stupid stuff <laughs> no, I know. it's it's the one we we did beach buggies for a grand tour special and I they they got pretty wrecked obviously because we drove them across Namibia and they're, they're not actually that good for using on a beach beach buggies it it ruins them pretty quickly mm. you know, all that sand and stuff they're not not, in, not big on sand the beach buggy. they're really not good on sand <laughs> not not good digesters of sand but anyway we got <laughs> we got back to Britain and mine was you know it was pretty ruined but I said I'll have the wreckage because mm. they were ours they belong I mean you know, without being boring they belong to our production company but I gave them the money that it was worth as yeah. a bit of a wreck and then i had the people who had built it originally rebuild it for me so it, it's you know it has a historical significance and it's also a correct in effect i mean it's not a real one but it's a correct manx beach buggy made with right. the correct pattern replica bodywork and it's got the you know the basics of the engine are the original beetle engine some of the chassis from the 50s yeah the floor wow. pan and the main suspension parts and so on so i thought i i don't want to I don't want to mess it up. Mm, if I was going yeah, to yeah, build yeah. another one, if I was suddenly seized with the need for two beach buggies, <laughs> I yeah, I would think seriously about. I mean, I think you can put some flat four Subaru engines in them as well. Ah, uh, yes, actually, yes, mm, yeah. yeah, which would make it sound great. I think, yeah, because it's a great engine, yeah, and quite compact. So I think you could have a lot of fun with it. But I mean, mine's got better brakes um, and better suspension, better springs and dampers. But the basic sort of steering geometry is still beetle. And I think if you made it too powerful, it locks up anyway when you mm. when you brake, you know, because it's yeah, yeah. all the weight. The weight isn't in the back. It's behind the car. It's sort of yeah. following. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah, the, yeah. the engine is in close formation. <laughs> so I think you'd have to be very careful. But as a thing to just biff around the country lanes, um, 
you know, with a bandana on living, let's be honest, a bit of a fantasy. Mm. It's fantastic. And it, yeah. it's actually, it's quite popular near, I'm talking about where our little hobbit cottage is down in the countryside, but it's, it's quite well known around there. People refer to it as the glitter bug. Right. And it's a bit like the local towns. It, it's almost like a mascot. Mm. You know, oh, James Brilliant. is glitter bugs out. It's parked in the town. You know, that's. That's a nice sign. That means everything's going to be all right. The stupid <laughs> body cars here. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a good day. Where do where do the where do the? I mean, I don't mean give us the location, but presumably the cars <laughs> don't live with you uh, full time because that would be one hell of a drive. Uh, well, in um, some of them live down in the sticks mm-hmm. where I have a few garages, and I do have a I, I do have a sort of top secret underground bunker. Okay, in with you. Mm which has not just my cars in it, it's got some other people's cars as well, but it's quite close to my house, so I can walk to it. Got it. And then the strange thing is, uh, Sarah, my other half, doesn't. she's not really that interested in cars, um, but she likes to have one so she can go off independently to buy things from garden centres and go and plant them in our <laughs> garden sod, because that's her main hobby. So, But her the panda was hers, Okay. Um, and I've adopted it, but it was getting a bit clapped out you know, it's done 120,000 miles, or whatever. And she was beginning to feel a bit vulnerable in it. And I said, yeah, you should probably have something a bit more modern. And I, this is a terrible thing to admit, but it had got to the point in life where I thought, oh, I've got to buy Sarah a sensible car because that's what she wants. And it's boring. Mm. So I found that the, the nearest dealer is a VW dealer or one of the nearest. And they cars were in, were in short supply, you know, six months ago. Yeah. Or so when I bought yeah. it. And I ran them and I said, what have you actually got? Have you got a polo? And then the bloke said, well, we've got a cancelled order. We've got a basic polo, which is white with a black interior. It's got no options on it, but it's quite well equipped. It's the one litre one. It's a mm-hmm. manual. And I said, oh, I'll have that one. Mm. Thinking, right, as, you know, in the way that people go to the shops and buy some cornflakes. Like this, it, this is an awful thing I'm admitting to. I fully appreciate that. So I don't want your listeners to say that James has turned into a right winger. <laughs> but anyway, the car was delivered. And it's absolutely fantastic. Mm, I knew no way. Say, I knew you were going to say that. It's fantastic. I mean, it's a one liter polo. It's not quick. It's not exciting, mm. but it works. It's it's so astonishingly well equipped for a yeah. supposedly basic Is that right? car. Yeah. Yeah. It's got connectivity with this, that, and the other. It gives you little messages. It plays tunes. It tells you <laughs> it's got reversing. Cam- and this has got no options on it. This is how it comes. Mm. And it's quiet. And it's it's sort of low burden, and it's just yeah yeah. I know I'm getting old. I'm sixty now, but the I I, I was driving it for the first time, and I was thinking I'll get rid of everything else and just have just this. have this that. Is yeah. actually because this, this is, is the best rem- car I own. Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. and it, and it reminded me actually why why I got into cars in the first place. What why I got into writing about cars actually is it's. Because it's not the car. I mean, supercars are exciting. That fast cars are exciting flashy cars you know can make you feel wonderful but mm. the, the real joy of the car is what it allows you to do and the basic yeah. car not only yeah. allows you to do the same thing are you go wherever you want mm. but it heightens the miracle of it because there's 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 no excess about that car really not by modern standards it is uh, yeah. a car an it is honest a little runner car. yeah but it's beautiful. I mean, it's 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 superbly made, and it's it's got all these things that it does, and you can, your phone comes up. It's got Apple CarPlay, and mm. it gives you driving tips as you drive. It tells you when to change gear. I tell it to fuck off, but <laughs> no, it does it anyway. And it even says things like Eco Tip, close window. And I think no, I just opened it because I wanted it open. But thanks anyway, because that's amazing. You know, I've opened the window. But you know what, James? We were James, uh, Jason and I were talking about this the, the other day because we are we are both. Far- fathers of 15 year old daughters um so we're approaching that time where we're starting to worry about you know teaching them to drive or indeed them being on the road and, and all these different scary things but it also the slightly exciting part of that is that we've both been looking at maybe just getting like a little a little banger mm. just like a little yeah. run around and i'm talking yeah. about spending i don't know two maybe three grand tops but just on something like a little one liter thing either sort of yep. 35 quid tax or zero zero you know no tax and whatnot but i would imagine that when i do this i will have the same approach as you are kind of go you know what it's the best car i've ever had i love it it mm-hmm. is you know? yeah. and that's the car that i will take to the shops and that's the car that i'll do all the local journeys rather than lumping my big three liter thing around you know and i think i think that's what i will fall in love with have you have you ever driven um i'm going to think of an example but there are lots a suzuki solario i haven't no but it Solerio. sounds like a lolly 
It I've does. driven one, yes. And it's it's a, I mean, that's a really basic car. It's very boxy. Yes. The interior yeah. is is very slabby. It's got three cylinder, yeah, metallic it, right? sounding. Yeah, and, and it, but I think it's fantastic. And I used to love the Perodua Kalisa. Do you remember, you know, the little rounded one from about ooh, it's best part of twenty years ago? It sort of no. almost looked like the new Mini should have looked. Okay, yeah, okay, a small thing. And I used to like all those and the Kia Picanto. Remember yes. the old, yeah, 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 the old Fiesta. I saw, I saw a Mark One Fiesta yesterday. Weirdly enough, and I looked mm. at it, and I thought, wow, I haven't seen one of those for many years. And it's tiny. Yes, it's a yes. really tiny little square cut car. Mm. And I thought, I bet that's brilliant. I bet it's brilliant fun because it's probably the 850 version and it's really simple. And those simple, simple cars, sort of one liter or even a bit less, they're just so immediate. They're sort of almost halfway to being on a bicycle or a moped because mm. you sort of sense everything and you get all the drama of driving, but it's not happening at huge speeds. You don't have to yeah. put massive tires on it. It's, it's, it's sort of almost poetic yeah. in a way. If I, 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 yes, everything's going. I'm buying a Polo, well, one do you, litre. Do you know, talking about everything going, I mean, uh, do, you, do you find it difficult to, to part with cars? I mean, are you one of those people where the, does, the, does the amount or the, the, the fleet for a grand term, does that get larger and larger, or do you try and sell one to get another one, et cetera, and keep them as similar? I've always tried to operate a with any one in like one out cars type or of policy. bikes or yeah. or even you know, wrist watches. Yeah, one in one out. But I've obviously failed at that because I didn't always have nine cars, so I must have gone wrong somewhere. <laughs> but um, I no, I don't really. I think by the time you part with the car, you're ready to part. Otherwise, mm. you wouldn't do it. And when people say, "Oh, which car? Which car did you get rid of and that you wish you'd kept?" I don't. I don't actually think there is one. I think if you think about it hard, no, you were right to let them go. And could I, could I let all the other ones go? I mean, I do think about this every day. <laughs> and I, some, I, I sort of slightly lack the courage. <clears throat> you know what? I'll be right, I'm going to be really honest with you now because I'm at the sort of age where I can be. So I've got an orange Ferrari with gold wheels. Mm. Um, and it's a, one, I mean, it's a truly wonderful thing. Uh, and I love it. It's fascinating. But I don't drive it that often. I took it out the other day for a bit of a spin. And that was the first time I've been away filming. So that was the first time for three or four months mm. that I'd even taken the cover off it. And I've done it. I've had several Ferraris and Porsches and things, and I, I've, you know, I've, I'm sure I've got it out of my system. I could, I could let it go, but could... there's a tiny bit of you think people won't find me interesting anymore because <laughs> I haven't got an orange Ferrari. I mean, let's be honest. People my age only have Ferraris because they're worried that women aren't interested in them anymore. Mm. That's the honest truth. So is it like an admission of defeat? I better get rid of the Ferrari. Nobody well, is it, it is orange, to be fair. Yeah, but orange is great. Yeah, I mean, I've never been a fan like the way of you red, on the red orange. And... Not, not yeah, the well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, well, well, I know. Now, now you do mention the wheels. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's orange. Do you know what? I've never really liked a red, a, a bright red Ferrari. I've always preferred like them in blue or grey. Well, interestingly, when I bought it, I, I, I set off determined to have one in, in the, not Tour de France blue, the dark one. I can't remember what it's called in the Ferrari colors. I used to know all these by heart. Yeah. I thought I'll have that, but I will have the gold wheels because that'll look quite classy. And then I went to the, <laughs> they have at Ferrari, they have a big version of the online configurator. Yeah, the, but it's the like Atelier. Ten, yeah, exactly, the Atelier. And you sit, you actually sit inside the car effectively while you're And it's fantastic. And I just tried the orange and I thought, do you know, I'm only ever going to buy a brand new limited edition ferrari once in once. my life yeah, sod yeah. it i'm having an orange one so Excellent. i got the orange um but it is ridiculous and I, I do feel a bit of a burke driving around in it if i was i'd never bring it to london you've got to be in the mood to drive them haven't you? you've really got to yeah. be up and in the move otherwise it, you just they're a bit too flat flashy aren't they they are a bit so so I, where so so what's it, the thoughts on electric then james well i think i mean <laughs> I understand the love for internal combustion because it is fascinating and it is yeah. it does give cars character and the character actually comes from the flaws in the system because you know engines have to be managed the fact that they yeah. need to idle that they have peaks and troughs in the delivery mm. you need a gearbox yeah. you know that's actually what makes them interesting to us mm. yes um but in reality electric cars as we've known for at least 100 years make sense because it's you know clean quiet low maintenance mm. easier to drive blah 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 but I think having experimented with them for, I mean, I've had an electric car since 2014, so right. almost 10 so, years. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it's not quite right. No. Because 
when I analyze it to myself, um, and I've got absolutely nothing else to think about, the the battery technology isn't actually good enough. The batteries are amazing compared with when we were kids or when the Sinclair C5 came out, there were still only lead acid batteries. Yeah. And in fact, milk floats had those. And the early electric cars, you know, back in America in 1910 had those as well. But the lithium ion battery is, is an amazing thing, but it's still not good enough for a car because even with the rapid chargers, it takes too long. Too long. Yeah. I know all the arguments for it. You do regular journeys, you top up at home at night. That's all true. But if you actually want to use the car to go around the country because you, I mean, nobody sells encyclopedias anymore, but you know what I mean, yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. It, it simply doesn't work. No. And people keep I trying agree. to kid themselves that it do, but we have to be honest about it. It needs another quite massive leap in battery technology or we also have to look at things like hydrogen oh. or yeah, even or synthetic fuels. fuels. Yeah. yeah. Synthetic fuels. Yeah. When I look into synthetic fuels, and I remember doing this years and years ago with a science show I was making for the BBC, I went to Albuquerque mm -hmm. in that's New Mexico, isn't it? Yeah. To a, a solar farm where they were, but they were pioneers in this, but they were effectively using the, the solar energy to a crack the hydrogen out of water and also run pumps that extracted the, the the carbon part of it out of the air. That you know, those are the two basic ingredients. And they got as far as making uh, ethanol, which I think is the simplest of the hydrocarbons. That's the simplest chain. Yes. And we we made enough of it on this day. And I'm talking about like a an espresso half an espresso cup, and we put it into a little model aeroplane that we were able to fly around to demonstrate that yes, you can make fuel this way. And it's come on a long way since then because that was a good 15 years ago. Mm. But yeah. It, I still feel it's going to be a boutique fuel because it's going to be expensive. It's going to be expensive because you yeah. simply have to shift such a lot yeah. of material to to extract it. So, I mean, in an ideal world, in just in the way that we you know currently have petrol diesel and petrol and diesel hybrids, I don't see why we couldn't have hydrogen fuel cells, especially if things like lorry and bus fleets embrace it. The cars mm -hmm. can piggyback on the back. It's not it's not the solution to just the car. It has to be a bigger mm. picture thing. So we could have some of that. We could have some hydrogen combustion, which will work in turbines and so on. Mm. A lot of people would be able to live with a battery electric car because they actually only ever make regular journeys and they're quite short. Yeah. And we'd be able to the enthusiasts would be able to have their orange Ferraris or their old Dodge <laughs> Vipers or whatever <laughs> with the synthetic fuel, which they'll happily pay more for because because they're only going to use them as a treat. Yes. You know, it, um and what's the other thing we can have that I just thought of? No, that was it. We can have all those. We can have four things. So we can have battery electric, hydrogen fuel cell, cell electric, uh, combustible hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen combustion, and synthetic fuels. I don't see. We don't have to choose one. We can have several. Yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, and sort of, you know, sort of adopt a, a mix of all different things. You know, to actually sort of, you know, cope with the the array of vehicles that we're trying to power, aren't we? You know? Yeah. And it's not just cars. Obviously you need to think yeah. about things like aviation and shipping. Yeah, of course. But, it, but what would you put your money on of those mm. four? Do you know what? I, I would want to put my money on e-fuel actually, I think synthetic fuel. Yeah. Yeah. I think primarily because this, the infrastructure is just there. So it's just yeah. about cracking that nut and trying to mass produce and bring the cost down cost of production because then you haven't got to dig in you, you know you've not got to dig infrastructure in which you would have to do for hydrogen yeah and, hydrogen and, is, and, and, and is electric as well yeah, but also presumably um you would just be able to with some kind of minor conversion all of the traditional petrol powered cars now would operate on synthetic fuels would they not with a conversion I'm not uh, even sure you need a conversion. I okay, don't think you need. need five. No, if you specify the fuel right, it should work yeah. straight yeah, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, you in, to... in itself, actually, when, when you think about it, is a far more green solution. Sorry, that's someone at the door. Uh, is a far more green solution than actually just junking all of, of this, you know, sort of historical metal when you could actually keep it going. Yes, well, that, that there is a case for that, and it's a very good argument. Mm. The, the, green, the answer to the, to the, the green issue is never... It's never simple. It's never a one-step thing. I'm worried that that person at the door might be someone who's oh, no, no, you being able to remember your, your it's, dad's number plate. It's fine. <laughs> it's a, it'll be an Amazon delivery and my daughter's downstairs. So it'll all be, it'll oh, okay. all be taken care of. <laughs> but I'll tell you what is the really difficult nut to crack, and that is shipping and aviation. Yes. 
aviation and I, is very I, yeah difficult. and i don't see that ever being battery because there's just not the energy density yeah, in no. the battery no, nowhere near so i think that has to be some sort of e-fuel yeah um or combustible hydrogen or combustible maybe. hydrogen yeah, yeah 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 but but ships christ what yeah, are they gonna I mean, that's just a lot of juice isn't it to to get yeah. those across the oceans it's, uh, it's yeah. uh, some people are saying sails there are still people who advocate sails yeah because they can be made so much more efficient than they could mm. in the 18th century <laughs> you know, well actually you know, what what do you reckon a a a big you know cargo bulk carrier container ship does in terms of knots what 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 do you reckon it does twenty knots maybe yeah max? I would have thought yeah not much more than that why well, I'm wondering if if because the original you know cl clipper the clippers of old they 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 were twenty five knots weren't they and they were you know, antiques so I wonder yeah. actually there might there might be something in that oh well I remember reading about it as a kid in. Yeah, it was something like Speed and Power magazine had an article about sailing ships of the future, which had these very high tech, I suppose they'd be carbon fiber now, sails yeah. rather than a lot of stuff flapping around and rigging. It had yeah. like just straightforward rigid poles. So no tars running up into the crow's nest or any of that stuff. It was just computer controlled sails. I remember looking at it thinking, well, yeah, it's quite windy at sea. Mm. Why not? Well, it sounds yeah. like it sounds like maybe James the subject of another book for you, you know? James oh, May God, Marvelous yeah. Sailing Vehicles or something like so, that to move on from from what you're doing at the moment. Yeah, so we've done human powered vehicles and then we have to have sort of nature powered vehicles. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Well, they, there you go. There's a there's another book sorted. I'm conscious that we're running out of time. I have two oh, more questions, one from me and one from Jason very quickly, if we may. Go on then. Yes. James, if you were to pick one car and one only from all of the vehicles that you've owned over the years and stick with it for the rest of your life, which one would it be and why? Yes. Okay. Let's say of the one. So if somebody comes around tomorrow and says, "I'm taking all your cars. You can keep one." Yeah. It's one of those. Uh, yeah. I would keep the Alpine. Oh, interesting. Be well, because I mean, now that's a stupid idea. It's got the world's most pathetic luggage space, <laughs> as you probably know. You can get yes. like a copy of the Beano and a sandwich in it. Yeah. Um, but I don't generally carry much stuff about, and I can always put it in Sarah's polo. I'm using that as a get-out. Mm. Uh, but I think the remarkable thing about that car, and it's very underrated to me, mm. is is that it's the the engineering is intelligent because it's been done. It's the core of it has the thinking in it. I.e., it's a bit smaller than a supercar. It's lighter. It only has a 1.8 liter engine, and it develops. Mine's the original one, 246 horsepower, which doesn't sound like a lot, but because it's small, it is plenty. Yeah. And then the tires are smaller, and the wheels are smaller, and it and it actually adds up into what people think is a sports car, but is actually a a downsized supercar. It's yeah. shrunk by 20 percent, and I think it's not a cheap car. Mm. Um, but it's a lot cheaper than a McLaren. And in yeah. terms for the amount of actual driving satisfaction you get for the money, and I'm including, you know, the cost of new tires, the insurance, the fuel bill, the road tax, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's absolutely remarkable. Mm. And in many ways, I think it might be the best car I've ever owned. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's yeah. very interesting. I, I love, I love, love, love it. I think they're great to drive. Really mm. great car. They're fantastic. And they have a yeah. slight, there's a this is cardboard stuff now but they have a slight quality of older 911 about them in that the front end is a little bit skittish yes yeah i think actually you could get yourself into a lot of trouble in that car if you weren't <laughs> careful because it's slightly deceptive yeah and it'll do that you know you accelerate out of a roundabout and you there's that that slight front end you know what i mean i'm not expressing mm, I, it very well, I know exactly what exactly you mean. like you get in an old 911 yeah an old air cooled 911. it just just wanders around a bit yeah doesn't, doesn't it? i mean it's quite it's very not, controllable but it's yeah to someone used to driving, say, a you know, a, a front drive hot hatch or something like that, it would feel a little bit, yeah, a bit odd, a little bit delicate almost. Yeah. But, um, but I love it. I think, in fact, I'm going to get it out this weekend because I haven't driven that for a few weeks either. Right, everything's going except <laughs> that and the beach buggy. Well, perfect choice. So, this is a question we ask all our guests because we generally believe that music and motoring go particularly well to get together. So. We want a fantasy drive. We want to know where you are, where you're going, what you're listening to, and most importantly, what are you in? Okay. And this can be anywhere. Mm. Or anything. 
Oh. And you're allowed to borrow Sarah's polo if you want. <laughs> um, yeah, the Bluetooth system is extremely good. <laughs> I think. Well, I think I'm going to take the Alpine, actually. Yeah. Given everything I've just said, how could I not? Mm. Yeah. But where shall I go now? Do I want to? Do I want to go somewhere scenic, very drivable, or exotic? i.e. do I want to drive through the West Country of England, which I very much like doing mm-hmm. right. for the scenery? Do I want to go um, maybe somewhere like Albania for the fabulous roads? Yeah. Very nice roads and not too busy. Mm-hmm. Or do I want to drive through somewhere like um, Japan because it's it's fabulous to look at and it, and it's you know everything about it is a bit of a mystery yeah. and jason it's jason will cover your fantasy shipping costs anyway to get the vehicle oh, okay <laughs> right so that gets the car anywhere i want to be god that's quite difficult we haven't even got to the music yet i'm going to go for i'm going to go for i'm going to make a quick snap decision i'm going to drive my car around the island of kyushu in japan nice there you go and i'm going to take the alpine and i'm going to listen to Am I going to? Doesn't feel like a sort of classical music event. It could be jazz, mm. or it could mm. just be straightforward rock and roll. Sod it! I'll take the complete ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And on that note, Jason, I think you need to take us out. Well, sadly, that is it for this week's fueling around, powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Dave, as always, huge thanks to you, but a massive thanks to our very special guest this week, the one and only Mr. James May. Thank you, mate. Oh, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. No, thoroughly enjoyed that. We could have talked for hours and hours. James's book, James May Marvellous Vehicles, is out now. Don't forget, as always, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at Jason Plato or at David Vitti. And if you like what you've heard, feel free to give us a five-star rating, press the follow button and share the podcast on all your socials. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Ta-da!